Last week, the Indy cars unleashed the Furies on Portland's road course. It was a learning experience from start to finish. Rick Mears learned turn one isn't three cars wide as he pushed into Scott Pruitt. PPG Cup leader Bobby Rahal learned not to get off course. This excursion left Bobby without a point toward the championship. Rookie Brian Till learned not to tangle with veterans like Mario Andretti. While Mario learned the fastest round between two points is not necessarily in a straight line, but skill kept him going. His son, Michael Andretti, taught everyone else a lesson in winning, leading flag to flag, as Michael learned his Ford can power a victory. Today, the Indy cars face the historic Milwaukee Mile. It can also teach drivers a thing or two. The Andretti's learned a hard lesson in 1989, nearly crashing on a pit stop. While leading that same race, Emerson Fittipaldi discovered that lifting his hand, even for a split second, can take you out of the lead and end the day with a damaged car and a bruised ego. Two years ago here, Allinger Jr. was hit from behind, but he learned to keep going as he righted the car and continued the chase. While Michael Andretti found out that leading doesn't matter at all if there isn't enough fuel to finish the race. He ran out with two miles to go, and little Al learned perseverance can pay off with a checkered flag. In last year's run on the Milwaukee Mile, Michael's education paid off as he roared to a win. That win was the impetus to go to the championship in the IndyCar. Michael returns here carrying the champion's number one, but to retain that number almost demands Michael win today. But it's a new season, and it's Bobby Rahal that comes here with a narrow lead in the points fight, with two wins and 80 points. His closest rival is the Indy 500 champion, Al Unser Jr. He holds 74 PPG points. In third is Penske driver, Emerson Fittipaldi, winner of the season's first race. He has 70 points. Fourth is the Long Beach champion, Danny Sullivan. They all look for the Milwaukee checkered flag and the 20 points that go with it in the Miller Genuine Draft 200. We're at Wisconsin State Fair Park as the Indy cars are ready to renew the season-long battle for the championship. Hello and welcome, I'm Paul Page at the race that almost wasn't. A year ago, this facility was in danger of closing, and then Carl Haas and his management team stepped in. They've refurbished the track and guaranteed the future of this race course. Now, they've lost the traditional date for this year immediately after the Indy 500, but the traditions of the Milwaukee Mile continue. Remember, some of the greatest racing drivers ever have run here. Names like Louis Meyer, Wilbur Shaw, Ted Horn, Eddie Sachs, even Jimmy Clark have run here. And the great champions of the Indy cars are here today. Bobby Rahal has the pole. He's never had the pole here. He's also never won this race. But there's another man for which a win here today is almost a must-do situation. That's Michael Andretti. For an update on that story, here's Jack Aruth. Well, Paul, remember one thing about Michael Andretti. He carries the number one plate, and last year he won this race and went on to score seven additional victories and unseat Bobby Rahal in the chase for the championship. Michael, how important is the victory today? It's going to be very big. You know, I think if we're going to do what we did last year, we, we have to win here and, uh, and win a few more to uh, catch Bobby because he's running really well. Your qualifying effort was not up to what you would have liked. What does that mean in the early going? Well, uh, hopefully if the car is right, it won't mean anything. But, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. The car fell a little bit better in the warm-up than it did qualifying, so we're hoping for better things. The win at Portland, how important was it to get that monkey off your back? Oh, it was very big. You know, I think it was big for the team, big for Ford. And, uh, you know, it was nice to finally break the ice and hopefully get this ball rolling. Paul, he's one man that wants to make sure that Bobby Rahal doesn't make a cakewalk of this 1992 championship. There were other surprises this week. And for more on that, here's my colleague, Gary Gerald. Jack, no question, maybe as big a surprise as Michael Andretti starting back in the third row are the two men who start right in front of him in the second row. Scott Goodyear, of course, we're familiar with that great story at Indianapolis, charged from 33rd to that dramatic second place finish by just 43 thousandths of a second. This qualifying effort today is the best of his career. And right alongside of him, driving the uh, car number 22, Scott Brayton. And never before, oh, well, I should say one time in his 12-year career, has he qualified better than he qualified here today. He starts fourth. The thing that's interesting about both of these men today, not only were they fast in qualifying, but they've been fast in every practice session. And now the challenge, of course, is to translate that speed in practice and qualifying into a strong 200-mile finish at Milwaukee. Let's go back upstairs to Paul Page. And both of the Scots are 
due for a victory any time now. It's a giant crowd here today under beautiful blue skies. Now, Danny Sullivan explains why experience is so important on a fast one-mile oval in this week's Tips from the Cockpit. Not all of what we do in a race car is reactionary. A lot of it comes from experience and anticipation. Uh, for example, you take a place like here in Milwaukee where you're running a mile and you're closing on a couple of cars and they're maybe battling with each other and you're following and watching a little bit what they're doing, you're going to anticipate that they're going to make a move like this and you're going to have something to go. Unfortunately, sometimes when you get them close to them, they'll do something that you're not expecting and then it becomes reactionary. Then you maybe have to jump out or move over here. And that comes from experience and being in a lot of situations beforehand. Unfortunately, not all of them are exactly the same, but that's what causes a reaction as opposed to just anticipating what's coming. The unfortunate part about a reactionary situation is that you can go the wrong way. You can think that the guy's going to go left and he goes right, or right and left, or that he's going to accelerate and he backs off anything. And then you react to that, and maybe you go the opposite way, somebody's there, you get out in the gray, something happens, then you, anything can happen. But I think that the mind has to be anticipating things so that when something does happen, that the reaction is going in the right direction. Everything on a one mile oval happens so incredibly fast. When I first came here, I was asking the guys, well, where do you really, you know, where's the most common place to pass around here? And Gordon Johncock said to me, we'll pass you everywhere from two feet inside the grass up to the wall. And really, that's the type of thing you're going to see here. So you always, always have to pay attention here, no matter you're a leader or the last in line. Race on a one-mile oval is a whirlwind. In Milwaukee, they don't need much of an excuse to party. In this case, the excuse is summer. The 25th annual Summerfest going on in Milwaukee all this week. And the Milwaukee 200 is part of it. It's a sellout at the Miller Genuine Draft 200 at Milwaukee to watch drivers like the great Emerson Fittipaldi and a great championship fight. Sam Posey has an overview of this year's championship situation. Each year, the championship develops like the plot of a play. Last year, Bobby Rahal took an early season lead, which he saw eroded race by race by Michael Andretti, who went on to win the championship. This year, the scenario is eerily similar. Rahal ahead again. And again, Michael Andretti catching up. But there may be significant differences. For example, Emerson Fittipaldi, just nine points out of first place, may very well be a factor. And Bobby Rahal himself, who was on the defensive last year, is this year supremely aggressive, determined that what happened last year will not happen again. The Milwaukee Mile, built in 1905, is one of the traditional bull rings that men like Bobby Unzer absolutely love. Paul, they call the mile tracks bull rings. I love them as a racer and a spectator. They make a lap every 22 seconds, which means a driver is almost constantly in traffic. The track surface is old and rough in some places, and while it could be smoother, many of the drivers think the rough pavement gives this place character. Now add to that the very flat turns and short straightaways, and you have a track that forces the chassis to be perfectly tuned. If it's not, or the driver's not 100% all the way, you don't stand a chance to win here. It's tough, but believe me, it's great racing. So that's the challenge, the Milwaukee Mile. The drivers are preparing to climb into the cockpits now. There's Eddie Cheever as he's ready. Let's take a look at the lineup in the starting field. On the pole with a new track record is Bobby Rahal, the winner at Phoenix and Detroit, alongside Rick Mears, who scored his first IndyCar win here in 1978. In row two, it's Scott Goodyear, the best start ever for the Indianapolis 500 runner-up, and Scott Brayton, who ran sixth here in last year's event. In row number three on the inside, Michael Andretti, a three-time winner and the defending champion of this race. Outside is Emerson Fittipaldi, who won the season opener in Australia. In row number four, Eddie Cheever, who finished second earlier this year on the Phoenix Mile. And John Andretti, he finished second here last year. In the fifth row, Danny Sullivan on the inside, who captured the Long Beach Grand Prix in April. And Mario Andretti to the outside, a four-time winner of this race. In row number six, Raul Boisel, who finished second three weeks ago in Detroit. And Scott Pruitt, who ran fifth here as a rookie in 1989. 
In row number seven, it's Al Unser Jr., who came home first at this event two years ago. And Mike Groff, making his first start of the season. In the eighth row on the inside is Robbie Gordon, making his third career IndyCar start. And Ted Prappas, a sophomore driver out of Los Angeles. In row number nine, Buddy Lazier, making his first start on the Milwaukee Mile. And Tony Bettenhausen, who is making his 11th start here. In the 10th row, Jeff Wood. Only five of his 33 career starts have come on ovals. And Eric Bachelard, an impressive freshman driver. In the 11th row, it's Steve Chassie, making his first start at Milwaukee since 1986. And Ross Cheever driving for A.J. Foyt. Alone in the 12th row, it's Brian Bonner, who cracked the top 10 in his second career start at Detroit. So we're ready for some fireworks on the Milwaukee Mile. This was fireworks in the Big Encore Thursday night, all part of fabulous Summerfest in Milwaukee. We'll be back for the start of the engines in just a moment. As the sun burns down on the Milwaukee Mile, the crews are quiet and ready, but the silence will be broken in just a moment as we're ready for that most traditional command. On behalf of the Miller Brewing Company and its genuine draft brand, gentlemen, start your engines! set to go as Emerson Fittipaldi makes a final check of the dials on his digital display in his cockpit. Bobby Rahal, the points leader, sits on the pole. He's set and ready to go. There's a great onboard view from Danny Sullivan and, of course, Michael Andretti. This could be a serious day of decision for Michael. Scott Pruitt still looks for his first victory in the true sports car in the front row. Already has begun to roll away. We're very close to racing in what should be one terrific afternoon. Look at that sky overhead. Absolutely clear. The temperature right now, 81 degrees, and the forecast is for sun throughout the afternoon over this giant crowd. And the race, one mile around. That's 200 laps, 200 miles. Michael Andretti holds the race record from that last year. And the first fuel stop should come at lap 62. It just depends on how the yellow flags go. The chassis in this race continue this season to be dominated by Lola. And the engines here today will, of course, Ford is right off a uh, win, their very first win a week ago at Portland. But still, it's the older style Chevy Indy V8A that dominates this field. Michael Andretti, a three-time winner of this race, as we look down through the rest of the former winners, and, of course, this season in the fight for the PPG Cup, the season-long battle, well, there are the winners thus far, with last week Michael finally scoring his first victory of the season, though he has dominated the season thus far in terms of laps led. Looking out the back of Eddie Cheever's car, camera mounted just underneath the rollover bar, over Michael's right-hand shoulder, as he begins now to heat the tires on the pit straight. And that sweeping grandstand behind. Let's go to the pits and Jack Aroot. Paul, a story that we've got to stay on top of is fuel consumption during the course of this race. 200 miles, 200 laps. In canvassing the crew chiefs, they are all concerned with the exception of Team Penske. Many of the other crews feel that they will need a minimum of 15 laps of caution before they won't be concerned about fuel at all. There is also a concern about tires as well. It seems that they only last about eight laps, then they fall off. They've also seen a lot of blistering of the right rear. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Jack, one man we haven't talked much about at the start of this race is Rick Mears. He's won here three times. He's still fighting the injuries from Indianapolis more than a month ago. He wears a brace on that sprained right wrist. It took a thrashing last week in the road course at Portland, but he soldiered through to a seventh place finish. He got the setup he wanted just before qualifying yesterday, right alongside Bobby Rahal in the front row. Can Mears, who won his first career race here in 78, get his fourth today? That's what the Penske team will be watching. Paul? On a nice oval track that I absolutely love as Rick Mears surges forward and then drops back, trying to get the rhythm to the start. Brian Bonner will not start his car today. They did not pull it out to the grid, so Brian Bonner is not in this starting field. Johnny Rutherford in the PPG pace car has begun the pace lap. 
as the pace car surges ahead and comes off of the second turn. We are now within a mile of the start of this great run at Milwaukee and plenty of onboard camera shots for you. Remember that the front row, and there it is, Bobby Rahal and Rick Mears will tend to catch the back of the field within a very few laps of the green flag. Unlike the Indianapolis 500, it is nice and warm here today. The tires should adhere perfectly, and the start should be terrific. There's that second row of Scots. Scott Goodyear, Scott Brayton, as they close in over Scott Pruitt's right shoulder. As now, they come off of the fourth turn, nicely aligned, a good-looking starting field, and they roll toward the green flag. Nick Bonaro has it, and they're underway. The Miller Genuine Draft 200. Bobby Rahal jumps out nicely in front, but a good move into second place by young Michael Andretti. Look at him on the backstretch as Michael Andretti drops into second place and now already challenges Bobby Rahal. Well, he is. You can see what Michael's attitude is right there. He just and Michael right. takes the lead of the race before the first lap is over. Now, remember, a lot of this is going to be with fuel in mind, Paul. What are they going to do about fuel later on? Michael will have to shift up a gear, throw the RPM down in order to save fuel a little bit, hoping that Bobby Rahal will do the same thing. Michael Andretti's team has been struggling with the setup on this car. Both Michael and Mario were saying their cars in the Numa Haas stable were not handling well. But boy, look at what they did on the start. They certainly learned something overnight. They had an extensive test session after Indianapolis, and it may have paid off. Michael started fifth. He took the lead in the first lap. That is the biggest jump that we have seen so far this year on the start. Bobby Rahal runs in second. You know, the race comes down, or see in the future a little bit, Paul, to two stops to three pit stops. I think what we see right now is Bobby Rahal is going for a two-stop race, if possible. It's assuming no yellow. And Michael is saying, I've got to go for the speed. Hopefully the other guys will run out of break. Third place, Rick Mears. Remember, he still drives with a sore wrist. As a matter of fact, during the practice, he got a quick pitch in the back end and had to fight it, and he said it hurt considerably. I watched him getting into the car yesterday. He is so fragile, so tender in every way. I talked to him this morning. His spirit, of course, is very aggressive, but his body is really hurting. There's Scott Brayton. He runs in fourth place. Right behind him is Emerson Fittipaldi. Good and show then for Brayton. John Andretti today. right behind Fittipaldi. Scott Brayton with a great start, and he's continuing to run well in the Amway car. This racetrack, Paul, has so much turn to it and so little straightaways that just watch the Scott Brayton, how long they're in the turns. It's almost all turns, so therefore, they're on the throttle an awful long time. You know what I was just thinking, Bobby? Br Scott Brayton often runs well, but not till the middle part of the race. He got an exceptional start here today. Well, he certainly did, Sam, but. But Scott has not had that many good races lately, and he's really trying to go. Remember, Milwaukee is what we call a race driver's racetrack. Watching a battle now for sixth place between John Andretti and Scott Goodyear. Scott Goodyear fell back a little bit on the start, and John Andretti has a good charge going now, as Scott Goodyear is lined up just behind him. Remember, we're in that early part of the race where the tires are still really fresh. The pace will change a little bit in about three or four laps. It's still very, very hot now. Already six laps into the record book as we continue to watch the battle for six as there goes Scott Goodyear down underneath John Andretti. They both continue to fight on through the third and fourth Scott Goodyear has seen his life turn almost up, upside down since that incredible second place in Indianapolis. He's been home only six days. His wife has been unable to travel with him because they have a newborn kid. Scott Goodyear, a very different man. Finally down the front stretch, Scott Goodyear is able to show his dominance and is now solidly in sixth place. Now, Milwaukee is done like a lot of other tracks. Look at how wide it is and how easy it is for cars to run two or even three different groups around it. Watch some of the cars are running down low and some up up high. And you can use this guideline by watching the yellow line through the turns. Going back, taking a look at the start once again. This is Michael's move for the front. Look at him sweep outside of Rick Mears on the start and slide into second place behind Ray Hall as they move to the back stretch. This is one of the greatest starts you'll ever see. And just remember that Michael Andretti has dominated the statistics for the last few years in terms of good starts and laps led. Here he comes surging by Bobby Ray Hall, who has got to be one of the most surprised men on the planet. And Michael Look, and Rahal almost Rahal walks the yes. back end of the car. Yeah. And within a single lap, Michael Andretti came forward around the top two qualifiers and took the lead. 
It's the fourth straight race that Michael has led the opening laps. You're on board with Bobby Rahal now as 10 laps are already complete with Michael Andretti out in front in a race in which he would desperately like to win. We'll be back after this message and a word from your ABC station. Back at the Miller Genuine Draft 200, the Milwaukee Mile, Michael Andretti leads the run as he works his way down through the first and second turn. Bobby Rahal runs in second place. Michael closes on Ted Pravis, but look at this. Michael begins to slow. Rahal comes up alongside. Rahal takes the lead. Michael Andretti very suddenly slows Bobby. Yes, it did. It almost looked like he sucked air in the fuel system, like he just didn't get any because... Yeah, because he was on the inside line. Let's go to the pits and Jack. Paul, what exactly happened is he changed the fuel settings. You know, you can go from, from plus one to minus one. Well, he went to minus two on the fuel setting, and all of a sudden it sputtered, but then it caught. So they're not at all concerned, other than they, they had a couple of very, very heart-stopping moments here in the pits. So Bobby Rahal takes over the lead. You look backwards from Bobby's car to Michael Andretti's, and Rahal now has the lead of this race. Bobby Hunter, what happened when he did that? Well, there's air in the line. I, uh, I guess that maybe the fuel pickup picked up a little air, but it didn't. There, there was an air in the line. It's the same thing that happened, but Michael is back up to his normal speed. He's slowed down in the such a way that he's at least shifted to his higher gear to save his fuel. Here he comes past Danny Sullivan. You can see how much faster he is moving than Sullivan. Of course, Danny Sullivan with the Galmer car, they've been struggling with that car this weekend. You yes, may wonder why a car that, uh, a chassis that wins the Indianapolis 500 has trouble here. Remember the unusual character of the Indy 500. It did not require a great handling car, merely a very skillful driver. Back on board with Bobby Rahal, the leader of the race. He has strong momentum coming into Portland. He had some problems, though, last week. We asked him how tough it was to go back to the shop after spinning off at Portland. I was embarrassed at that, that we would allow that to happen. And um, if anything, sometimes you need the slap in the face to, uh, not that you weren't focused, but just to sort of say, okay, you know, it's, you, know, you run to these points in time where you either stay where you are or you go beyond. And I think after this race, after Portland, we're gonna, it was that and you decide we're going beyond because I don't like being embarrassed. So Bobby Rahal runs in the lead. He comes up behind Al Unser Jr., who currently runs in 12th place, and now puts little Al one lap down, but Al's, Al's not going to have it for the moment. And there's traffic in the form of Scott Pruitt and Jeff Wood line just ahead. I think that spin at Portland last week really galvanized Bobby Rahal and made him realize that he cannot play a defensive game against Michael Andretti. He's got to be aggressive and go out to win races. He's more than capable of it, despite his increasing age, and I think we're going to see a terrific season, maybe his best ever. You know, you can watch the traffic here. You can watch the TV screen. You see the cars on the right side of the screen, the left side, high low on the racetrack. Watch the traffic. Imagine what Ray Hall is having to do to keep Michael Andretti behind him, yet get through this traffic. Well, Bobby, hurry. you've won a race here. What was it like? I mean, it's a handful every second. Oh, it certainly is. It's the nicest race track in the world because look, look how wide it is right there. Any place you want to run. And the group today is from the wall clear to the yellow line and, and even below the yellow line, Sam. But the traffic, look at there. Wow. Where Scott Goodyear went in between two cars. But you can do that at Milwaukee. And notice, too, in the onboard camera shots of Bobby Rahal, how he is able to really run about anywhere he wants to on the track. So as we take a look, there is Scott Goodyear as he just split between two other cars heading out through the corner. He's got Scott Brayton. That's Mike Groff to Scott Brayton's right in the yellow car. There's Brayton there right behind. Scott Brayton with a nice little run, though he's dropped back a bit. He now runs in fifth place. They feel so strongly about the run that the Indy cars are making now in the Dick Simon team. That is, they raced last week at Portland, this week here on the Milwaukee Mile, and next week in Loudoun, New Hampshire, that the uh, sponsor, Amway, created a special flight, a private charter flight, just to get the team back so they could work on the cars and have them prepared for this race this weekend. Eddie Cheever, as he darts underneath his teammate, Ross Cheever, you mentioned the logistics of getting from Portland to here. That was a 40-hour drive for all the drivers of those big rigs. Very tough point in the schedule. 
So on board now with Eddie Cheever. Robbie Gordon, of course, was his teammate that we ducked under the inside of. Now, originally, Ari Leyendijk was scheduled to race on the ovals for Ganassi Racing at his Eddie Cheever's teammate. That yeah. didn't happen. No. Now, I asked Chip Ganassi, he said, well, it's because we were using last year's car. Well, that's not true, Paul. And Robbie Gordon is what we call a Ford driver. Mike Cranifus with Ford had decided to take him under his wing and put him on the team and make an IndyCar driver out of him in a hurry. And he's certainly giving him good equipment because the Ford engine right now is on top of the ladder. Watching now as you got a glimpse of Rick Mears as he falls through the field. And there is Raul Boisel coming down on the inside. And Mario Andretti to the high side as Boisel tries to get a wheel underneath of Mario Andretti. Bosell and Fittipaldi's in the middle of that fight, too. Bosell in the blue car there, replacing Hero Mashusta, who started the season in that car. It's really his deal. Bosell's such a nice guy, and he did so well in Detroit three weeks ago. He was terrific in qualifying here uh, in practice. I mean, he was second fastest for a while. He qualified badly, but he told me this morning they know exactly what was wrong with the car. He expected to move up, and that's exactly what he's doing. Raul Boisell, the 11 car currently runs in ninth place and look behind him. That's the leader of the race, Bobby Rahal. His first lead in Milwaukee since 1982. It's a part of the Miller Plank Road Brewery. Frederick Miller came here in 1855, started producing 300 barrels of beer a day. Now it's a giant modern complex. The old brewery is still a museum. They still have it open to the public. There's Robbie Gordon. We're under yellow. Yellow just came out for Robbie Gordon, who rolled to a stop in the first turn. Now he's under tow behind the IndyCar safety vehicles, and the rest of the field will line up now behind the PPG pace car and Johnny Rutherford. So the first yellow of the day comes out on the 32nd lap. Now the rules of this race are, in case you're wondering about this lineup, that the field will come out behind the pace car. Pace car just going to get out there as fast as it can. Then while they are running under the yellow, they will readjust the field, waving cars by until they get the right leader of the race. Already, Michael Andretti has been in and out of the pits, as has the leader of the race, Bobby Rahal, and that gives the lead of the race over to this man, the 15 car, the McKenzie machine of Scott Goodyear. Well, normally they would be in pitting it as we normally would see at a race, but they're not going in right now because it wouldn't do them any good right now because they must go into the 60s bracket. Otherwise, they have to make three stops. Let's go to the pits, Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, that's exactly right what Bobby's talking about. We might see some three-stop racers here. Now, in the case of Michael Andretti, that caution came out at a good time because he was complaining of understeer. When the caution came out, he was able to cool the tires down. He said, make no changes. But more importantly, they check their fuel consumption. They're going to gamble now. They've gone and put the setting at zero. They're going to run with full boost and full fuel consumption. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. And Jack, it's now a three-stop race for Bobby Rahal. He came in and was out in under 10 seconds, but what cost him? Slowing down, he had to maneuver around Eddie Cheever's car. Consequently, Michael got out and got a position ahead of him on the racetrack as we anticipate green. You saw Chip Ganassi and Ari Leyendijk. Ari watching from the Ganassi pit. Scott Goodyear will have the lead with 36 laps to complete as we now begin to string back toward the green flag. Michael Andretti is second, Bobby Rahal third. Raul Boisel, who also did not stop, runs in fourth place. Then Scott Brayton and Eddie Cheever. And we're back to green once again. Keep an eye on that blue and silver car. The leader of the race, Scott Goodyear. Green flag is out. Field strings its way off of the second corner. And now Michael closes in on Scott Goodyear. Michael moves to the outside. Scott Goodyear takes the low line, and Michael comes around. But there's traffic ahead. Michael may be able to trap Scott Goodyear down below Scott Pruitt. And in fact, he gets it done. Scott Goodyear gets caught up behind Al Unser Jr. as well. And Michael Andretti is back in the lead of the race. Scott Goodyear falls to second. Ray Hall third. Now remember, Michael Andretti, that's one of the Ford engines. Scott Goodyear, that's a Chevrolet engine. Right on board here with Scott Pruitt. Another Chevrolet engine. Two Fords, Michael and Mario Andretti. So you can kind of get an idea how the Fords are running against the Chevrolets. Wonderful couple of seconds there. The first time ever that Scott Goodyear led an IndyCar race. Michael Andretti has led more than twice as many laps as his closest rival, Rick Mears, in the last hundred races. An extraordinary achievement. He's also had more poles.
goals and more points and more everything that really leads to speed. And now Bobby Rahal, you saw him as he came around Scott Goodyear. He's working on Al Unser Jr., who is a lap behind the leaders. But Rahal now in second place and has set his sights up on the leader of the race, Michael Andretti. Al Unser Jr. looked like he tucked in there trying to pick up a toe from Ray Hall. Well, he did. They both have the same type of engine, go down the straight and wait the same speed. The problem is that the Gallimore car doesn't seem to work on the ovals too good. Whereas that car right there, Bobby Ray Hall's is the Lola. They really work good in the turns. Nice thing about Ray Hall's team this year that really seems to be working for him is he is really in a very tried and true setup. The older Chevrolet engine, a Lola chassis, brand new team, but it's working very well. Well, also, Paul, every team here is trying to figure out what that team right there has on the chassis. They're doing something secret. They have something the other guys don't know about. But remember, these cars are almost spec cars. You can literally see everything, but they're hiding. It's interesting, though, as Bobby Rahal passes Scott Pruitt in a specially made true sports car, Pruitt's car, and we have the Penske car specially made, the Galmer car specially made, that this car here, you, you see Bobby Rahal driving, and this one of Scott uh, Goodyear's are both just stock Lola's bought from the factory. So for all the special efforts by the team to, to gain a special mm -hmm. advantage, they might as well just have written a check to Lola and gone racing. Now the great sports car driver, Raul Boisel, is closing up on the back of Scott Goodyear in a battle beginning for third place. Behind Boisel is Scott Brayton, then Eddie Cheever, Rick Mears, Mario Andretti, and John Andretti. Nine cars run on the lead lap. 43 laps are complete for the leaders Whoa. of the race. Look at that as Scott Goodyear just threads the needle. That kid is doing a good job. You know, it seems like Indianapolis gave him the shot in the arm that he needs. He is really being aggressive, and I know the Jim O'Donnell that, that sponsors that car and all the Canadians are happy with that boy now. Well, I think it was Derek Walker, his crew chief, that's really made this the year of Scott Goodyear because he's prepared the car race after race and gotten him up front. Let's go back and take a look at Michael's move that put him in the lead of this race while we keep track of this battle for third place for you. There is Michael, Scott Goodyear just ahead of him. Michael moved to the outside. Scott got trapped a little behind the slower car of Al Unser Jr. And just that quick, Michael Andretti had the lead back. On the outside of one, inside of the other one. That shows you how good Michael's handling. Continuing with that battle for third place, Scott Goodyear tries to hold off a charging Raul Boisel, Jack Aroot. Well, it was a ga calculated gamble on the part of Derek Walker to leave Scott Goodyear out there. They thought they might be able to stay running up at the front. But Goodyear is complaining of a slight bit of understeer, but he still feels that they can go and do this race in two stops. Well, Scott Goodyear should be able to go, having not yet stopped another, oh, at least 15 laps or so before he has to come in. This is exactly the way Ari Leyendijk won a couple of important races on the miles last year in Phoenix and Nazareth, not coming in on that first flag. So anything is possible here. Yes, because really, Sam, it's about a two-lap penalty. Not a penalty, but a loss. Setback. The guy comes yep. in to make a fuel stop under the green flag. And it's a good gamble if you can do what Scott's trying to do sure, right now. Sure, because it's not only the time you're stopped to say 13 to 15 seconds, it's the time decelerating and getting back up to speed. So now 48 laps are complete. Michael Andretti has the fastest lap thus far at 150.8 miles an hour. There are the stats computer generated off the EDS system of Scott Goodyear. We hope to have a lot of this kind of information for you on a computer link from the EDS scoring computer over to something that Walter Bull and our staff put together. And boy, it's terrific. It's a lot of great information. Bobby Unser. Ralph Boisel is up to fourth place also. This is part of the Dick Simon team taking over Masucha's place. The Japanese boy that got his leg broken at Indianapolis. He's been doing it right there. He's been doing an awfully good job. So there is the car 11, Raul Boisel. His highest finish thus far in IndyCar racing was just three weeks ago. You saw him here on ABC in Detroit. We asked him if that second place finish got him thinking about the time when he may get his first victory. And look, there is Scott Boisel. Goodyear and Boisel as they battle back and forth, and that fight continues. Boisel Let's watch is really, him for a second. He's really putting it to Scott Goodyear here. And there is Boisel as he's inside Goodyear again. We'll just stay with this fight for a moment. Boy, this is some terrific racing as they continue to work around here. And now look closing up on Scott Goodyear. Another pass being attempted. This time it's Cheever down inside. 
So now let's again ask Raul Boisel about what he thought, whether or not he had some impetus gained from that victory in or the scoring in Detroit. That was uh, very happy when I finished second in uh, Detroit. And uh, I started to imagine that I would have a chance to win this this year and uh, the way things going. And uh, I, I don't put more pressure on myself. I just think it will naturally will come. And uh, that's the way it's supposed to be. And um, but of course, uh, I want to take the monk out of my my back, you know, my shoulders to, to prove that uh, I'm here to stay. And, uh, I uh, always had, uh, you know, a potential uh, to win. I have ability to win. Uh, was just be in the right place at the right time. So Raúl Boisel continues his battle. He runs in third place now, chasing Bobby Rahal. There's Eddie Cheever. He's the fourth place car, and you can see Boisel riding just ahead of him. Now remember, uh, one more time, I want to keep telling everybody that's a Ford engine and Eddie's car. The Andretti's have Fords, Cheever, the Chip Ganassi cars have Ford, which is Eddie Cheever's one of them. So Eddie Cheever rides in fourth. Let me give you the top of the order. Michael Andretti followed by Bobby Rahal, Raul Boisel, then this car, Eddie Cheever, then Scott Brayton is behind him, then Rick Mears, then Scott Goodyear, Mario Andretti, and John Andretti. Those are the cars on the leader lap. And there is Andretti now closing on Scott Goodyear. And a battle developing now for seventh place. Scott Goodyear is falling steadily backwards and having some trouble handling up the traffic as well. So I think handling is very definitely the problem. And here comes Mario Andretti as he tries to move inside Scott Goodyear. Mario taking a very low line. But the momentum going into the corner belonged to Goodyear. Still, Mario is in a good position to attack on the backstretch. Well, this is the penalty that Scott Goodyear is paying. As you see, Mario on the backstretch about to set him up as they go into turn three for not having changed tires. You lose grip here and you lose speed. Simple as that. Still, Mario Andretti is not able to fully attack Scott Goodyear. A good gamble, I think, by Derek Walker and the team. And for the moment, Scott Goodyear is able to hold off the charging Mario Andretti and remains in seventh place. 56 laps are now complete. Michael Andretti is the leader of the race, and he is being chased by Bobby Rahal. Back on the Milwaukee Mile, the Miller, genuine draft 200. 60 laps now complete. Michael Andretti leads. Bobby Rahal, the points leader, is chasing him. Eddie Cheever has a nice run. Raul Boisel and Scott Brayton both have terrific runs going. Right. As the average speed of the race now at 133 miles an hour, closing on the track record. Ray Hall cut the lead from about four seconds and changed down to two seconds as Michael Andretti got caught up in a little traffic, lapping slower cars. He is now pulling back away again from Ray Hall. You know, it doesn't make any difference, Sam, where you look on this racetrack. There is good, hard racing. The slower cars, the faster cars, they're all going at it. You ride with 13th place, Danny Sullivan, the Galmer car, as he works his way through traffic, though he runs a lap behind the leader of the race. Danny Sullivan, too, like most of the cars here, have made their first pit stop of the day. Those that have not yet made it are Raul Boisel, Scott Goodyear, Scott Pruitt, Al Unser Jr., Eric Bachelor, and Ted Trappist. So those are cars that are hoping that somewhere very soon that there's going to be a caution period so they will be able to stop because any time now they are all due to roll into the pits. Very often the guys have to gamble on something like that when their cars are lacking in speed and the guys you named up Paul are all lacking in speed so they need a yellow flag so they can pick back up one or two laps free. As Gamble see, is very much worth it. As we see Scott Brayton here, he is doing so well in the last couple of races, and I believe part of that is because of the presence of his teammate, Raul Bosell. Bosell has barely good feedback to the Dick Simon crew, where I think Scott Brayton would say something in, in years before and maybe not be believed because he has an unusual hard into the turn style. When Raul Bosell says it too now, they believe and they're making good progress on that team. Well, those Dick Simon teammates are now lined up, ready to do battle with one another. Roy Bosell sits there in fourth place. Scott Brayton is battling with him. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, we're here with the crew because the Simon team split on that yellow. Brayton made a pit stop, got fuel and tires. It's a three-stop race for him. Bosell did not. We're waiting for him to make now what looks like will be a green flag stop. Yeah. We're keeping an eye on that number 11 car. He's on the back stretch now. Any time he called to come in, the yellow flag notwithstanding, he's managed to go 67 miles without taking on fuel yet. So we'll continue to watch Raul, who runs in force. Scott Brayton 
is right behind him. For the moment, not really challenging. He seems content to watch that. But Rick Mears is now closing in on Scott Brayton in what should open for a battle for fifth just any time now. At the lead of the race, it is still Michael Andretti, chased by Bobby Rahal, but there's a full seven-second separation between first and second place as 69 laps, 69 miles are now complete. They're still racing all over. They're just going at a tooth and toenail. But remember, fuel, it's going to start deciding the thing pretty soon, Paul, because you're going to find out the guys that are looking at a two-stop race versus the one-stop race, and there's still no yellow. There's fourth place, Raul Boisel. Fifth place is Scott Brayton. And just behind Scott is Rick Mears, Jackaroo. And, Paul, what Roger Penske has done to Rick Mears is they played a conservative at the start of the race. And we told you at the beginning of the show that they seem not at all concerned about fuel. They still turned the boost down. Just about four laps ago, Roger radioed to Rick, you now can run at 100%, and that's what he's doing. And you saw Scott Brayton sweep around his teammate, and Brayton has now picked up fourth place. But remember, Boisel should be in the pits any time now. Now Rick Mears is challenging at the back of Boisel's car in an ongoing fight for fifth place. And the leader of the race, Michael Andretti, is coming up behind this battle, trying to lap all of them. You, you know, can see Bob, vividly what a difference it makes when you go to the full uh, ridge throttle setting, because uh, because you saw Rick Mears, who had been uncompetitive with Boisel before, just shoot by him. Rick Mears now knows that Michael Andretti is right there behind him, wanting to put the sixth place car of Mears a lap down if he can. But Mears is locked in a fight of his own. Well, he's got to. You know, I started there, Scott Goodyear in the pits. It pissed off, but I don't think the crews often tell us television people exactly when they're going to pit. Let's go to Gary Gerald. We're checking now. They tell us it may be two laps for Bosell. The car's a little bit loose, so we anticipate a bit of a change to try to create more downforce. Scott Goodyear is out of the pits in 17 seconds, but it drops him down through the field and puts him a lap behind the lead. I started to say, Paul, I don't think some of the crew members or the owners tell us exactly what their game plans are because a lot of these teams have televisions in their pits, believe it or not. Well, Michael Andretti leads this race. Bobby Rahal is not challenging at the moment. They tried, Bobby, under an interesting tactic as we watch Michael Andretti work around this track. They tried an interesting technique with Rahal's car. They know that it tends to push after a while in the race. So they actually started up with a setup that they didn't like, hopefully, so that it would come neutral. Do many drivers do that? Oh, they definitely do because how the tires change. For example, I talked to the Rick Mears crew before the race, and they said that they were going to go with what they call sticker tires. That means new tires after every pit stop. No break in on the tires. So that's something that's different right there. That tells you they're planning for the race further down the road as opposed to early in it. Three cars have not stopped. This is one of them. Now, Al Unser Jr. makes his stop. Raul Boisel on the roll as well. He's in the pits. Gary Gerald is there. A lot of fluid coming from the back of the car, Paul, as they make the tire changes. Remember now they said the car was a little loose. We anticipate a wing change to give him more downforce. There we see it. Hiro Machusta on the scoring stand normally drives this car watching. This is not a particularly fast stop. We've got it at 19 seconds. Exactly right, 19 seconds as Raul makes his stop. By the way, Hero should be back in the cockpit of a race car for the Simon team at the Toronto race. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. We're back at the Miller Genuine Draft 200, the Milwaukee Mile. We take a look at the rundown after 80 laps and watch Emerson Fittipaldi as he tries to worry John Andretti. The two of them have been battling for some time now, and we'll keep an eye on this fight. And it is a fight for seventh place at the front of the field. It is still Michael Andretti running now at a record pace of 135 miles an hour. His record last year was 134.5 miles an hour. So Michael Andretti is really flying, and that's considering we have had one yellow already for six laps. So Michael Andretti is setting the pace here his fastest lap thus far, 150.8 miles an hour. There's Fittipaldi, John Andretti just in front of him as they continue their fight. Emma's not working very well, Paul. We watch Emma right there on the screen. He's not been good. He's not been really fast in the practice deals. Having trouble with the Pinsky car normally. This guy who's a road race driver is exceptionally fast here at Milwaukee. 
Well, Emerson Fittipaldi had the lead of this race back in 1989 coming off of his Indy win and then suddenly spun between turn one and two caught the wall and was out of the race just that quick. Well, he waved in anger to a slower car <laughs> yeah. that he was trying to get around and wouldn't move over, and that wave cost him dearly. A little bit of temperament there, and he went into the wall. So we watch Fittipaldi, and Jack Aroot continues to watch this same car for the Penske pit. And Paul, it's not surprising that Emerson Fittipaldi has had his problems because from the start of the race, he has complained about the car, believe it or not, being extremely loose. So on this pit stop, which should come about lap 95 to 97, they are going to adjust the wing and hope to cure that problem. Jack, you can see how tentative he is going into the turns. He can't just drive it in hard. He has to feather it in, and it isn't until midway through the turn right about here that he really starts to get on the power. And Sam, as I said, this is the first car that's reported a loose condition. Everybody else has had understeer, and they've waited a little bit for the track to come to them. So Fittipaldi continues his fight with John Andretti for seven. And what that means when they change the rear wing is they have a little wicker bill in the back, a little flap on the top of the wing. They just slip one out and slip a new one right back in a little bit bigger, and that gives a lot more downforce. Well, as you saw during that flurry of the first stops, many things occur during a pit stop. Tires are changed, refueling, but as Gary Gerald tells us, there are some small details in a stop that always make the difference. During a pit stop, we frequently talk about, and we frequently see, a crew member making a minute wing adjustment at the front of the car that impacts the setup of the race car. In an oval track configuration normally, the distribution of weight from downforce is roughly 60% at the rear, the other 40% up here at the front. Now, after the tires have been changed, you'll see a crew member reach around to this front wing and grab this little knob right here. He may turn it clockwise a half turn. What he's doing is changing the angle of this plate on the wing, only fractionally. A half turn means that this angle has changed two tenths of one degree. That's all. But what that does is create about another 10 pounds of downforce on the left front. It means that this corner is going to be pinned to the racetrack. The car is going to want to turn easier to the left. On an oval, you're always turning left. Now, on a road course race, they make the change not only at the left front, but at the right front at the same time, because you're turning left and turning right. These minute changes that come about through countless hours of wind tunnel testing impact the center of balance of this race car. It may move the downforce more from the back toward the front or vice versa. You know, it's those little tiny changes. Remember, we're talking about two-tenths of a degree with a half twist here. That can mean the difference between an ill-handling race car that's not competitive or a finely balanced car that may get you to victory lane. And that ability to constantly change the car is what makes the difference, especially on a mile. We watch Buddy Lazier. He runs in 21st. He really hustled his car around here when he qualified 17th the other day. His equipment is just not quite up to his talent. And you know, he's passionate about racing. Uh, he's a man that I ho hope does not take too many risks too early in his career trying to prove himself. His dad, of course, very experienced driver himself, is in his corner giving him advice. I think the guy has a great future. I took four positions away from this guy. He's car 21. He runs in 17. He'd rather race than he would eat. He's a very good young race driver. Needs to get a better car, or he needs to get this car going a little bit better with some more money. So on the Milwaukee Mile, 95 laps are complete as we now are within five miles of the halfway point. Eddie Cheever still runs in third place. Scott Brayton is right behind him as Eddie comes on to the front stretch once again. And Emerson Fittipaldi rolls into the pits, Jackaroot. And Paul, we're going to wait to see if they're going to make the wing adjustment. No work on the wicker bill yet. They're completing the work on changing the tires. Now, as Gary Gerald alluded to, there are two very small areas there, and they do. They make the adjustment on the front wing, and he is off and away. Bobby, it looked like they put some major angle in the left front. Yes, it, it, what they do is you can also, you can work the front wings, and it affects the rear wing, because if you take it off the front, the rear's working better. So it all depends what Emil called for on the thing. Whereas the computer has helped a little bit on that. The inner flow of technology might tell you something, but it's still the way it feels to the driver. Yes, in fact, right now during the race, they wouldn't use the computer for anything other than to know what their fuel mileage is and what they have left in the tank. Right now, the decision on that change is made by ammo, like you said, Paul. 
Rick Mears and Scott Goodyear not a battle for position Scott Goodyear is struggling to stay with the pace of the race Mears runs in fifth place a lap down to the leader Michael Andretti Scott Goodyear is in tenth place he is three laps back Boy, it's amazing. You know, at the speeds that they're turning today, Michael has got the wick turned up hard today. He's raising what we call the price of poker right now. He's making everybody run a lot harder than they wanted, plus he's running away from them. Rick Mears now rolls into the pits, and Jack Aroot remains in the Penske group. And Richard Buck and the crew await the arrival of Rick Mears. He comes to a stop. They are, conversely, not going to make any adjustments to the wings on the car. They're just going to change tires. They are, unfortunately, a lap down. They had a malfunction in their first pit stop when both Penske cars pitted at the same time. And Rick was a little tight. 14.5 seconds. And Roger Penske radioed to Rick just a couple of laps ago. You, sixth gear, were a lap down, but let's let them know we're here. And Jack Aroot, Rick Mears, makes that stop on the halfway point, lap 100. Wouldn't that tell you we're looking for at least another one out of that group? Absolutely. You've got to take a stop there. And the guy that I'm concerned about right now is your leader, Michael Andretti. Everybody told us at the start of the race that you would need 15 laps of caution. Remember, he's the driver that went to full fuel the earliest in the course of this race, and he has run out of fuel here before. Thus far, only six laps of caution, one yellow flag in this race for a toe-in. So Michael Andretti, completing 102 laps, runs in front and is averaging a record 135.9 miles an hour. And remember, everybody else on the racetrack, including Rick Mayer, Roger Pinsky, that group, they all have to make their decisions based on that man right there, what he does. When he makes his pit stop, that's Michael Andretti. When he makes his pit stop and how fast he runs, basically controls the race. Michael Andretti has had the fastest lap in the race at 150 miles an hour. Bobby Rahal, the second fastest, just under that, 149.9. But it was Rick Mears who has had the third fastest. You saw Buddy Lazier peel off to start his pit stops. Don't forget, we've got coverage coming up, more coverage of the Indy cars and their battle. This time, for the first time on ABC, the Molson Indy Toronto, July 19th. A fabulous course that winds its way through Exhibition Place in Toronto. 4 o'clock Eastern on the 19th of July. Join us there. Danny Sullivan, you ride with him now as Bobby Rahal is in the pits and Gary's there. First stop was under yellow. This one under the pressure of the green. Everything looking routine. They make the wind change up front. They clean the radiators, waiting to get all the fuel in. He's rolling 13.6 seconds on our clock call. Good stop. And Scott Brayton makes a stop. He runs in fourth. The last of those cars that continue on the lead lap with Michael Andretti. Michael still has not made his second stop. Eddie Cheever with Rahal's stop assumes second place, but Eddie Cheever has not stopped as well. Now you ride on board with that second place car. Remember, this guy, Eddie Cheever, finished second behind Bobby Rahal on the mile at Phoenix in the second race of the season. Can he do that again? Can he possibly win? Now the crew, the Newman Haas team, waits for Michael Andretti's alive, arrival. 105 laps are complete, and Michael rolls into the pits. Jack Arut is in the pits. And Mario Andretti's crew moves some tires so Michael can have an unobstructed run to his pits, and they go to work. Let's listen. So far, a normal stop, checking in front of the radiators to make sure they're clean, and they are taking long, simply to take as much fuel, and now the car won't move. 15 plus seconds, but when he lit the tires up, they were over a patch ball page here on Pit Road, and the car literally did not move. It was as if the front brakes locked up. He could have been out in 13 seconds. It actually was almost 19 before he rolled away. Michael Andretti, something happened in that gearbox. The he brakes are awfully hard when it comes in. They're hot, rather. Milwaukee, you can use an awful lot of brakes. And in fact, you can use even more. He may not have lost all that much, though, because he had one of the hottest entrances and exits from the pits that we have seen in that sequence of pit stops. The Milwaukee Mile here, by the way, is also the site of the second round of this year's Texaco Haviland pit stop competition in which the top 10 qualifiers for today's race compete for additional prize money, a total of over $135,000 available at four selected IndyCar events to the teams, which not only prepare their cars to be the fastest in qualifying, but also spend the least amount of time in the pits, like this car. John Andretti, he makes his second stop of the day. He runs in seventh. 
Dave, John Andretti cannot seem to get that car handling when they first get on a racetrack out of the trailer. It takes them all weekend to get the thing competitive. What is wrong with their initial setup? I don't know, but it happens weekend after weekend. Sam, Sam, what they don't do is they don't have an engineer. Jim Hall, the owner, acts as the engineer on that crew. Sometimes I think it holds them back, not that Jim isn't good. Eddie Cheever, you're right on board with him. You saw his crew getting ready to lay out all of the equipment because now Cheever is the leader of the race, but he has only one stop complete and he should be rolling into the pits already. He comes down below the line and the rest of the field rolls fast as Cheever heads into the pits and toward Gary Gerald. Paul, you indicated Eddie Cheever had that great run in the Oval at Phoenix. Remember, he's the man who is taking time to get used to the Ovals. He's learning to love the Ovals as opposed to his road racing background. He wants to improve on that second place finish in Phoenix. Everything looks routine here he milked this stop further than the others the stop not quite as fast as some of the others at just over 15 seconds michael andretti took the lead back there he is going into the first turn while eddie cheever was into the pits you saw a wing adjustment to the front left wing of eddie cheever's car the same adjustment that they made to bobby rahal's car almost two full turns on the wing so now with two stops complete and 111 miles already into the record book, Michael Andretti is back in the lead, again being chased by Bobby Rahal. Back at the Miller, genuine draft 200 on the Milwaukee Mile, 117 miles complete. Michael Andretti is the leader, 21 seconds back, almost a full lap is Bobby Rahal. And Michael Andretti is running in some rather close company lately as we take a look down through the top 10 of this race. Remember that Michael had a most interesting pit stop. He had a problem as he pulled out. Jack or Root, do you have any idea what it was? Well, Paul, remember we alluded to the fact that maybe the brakes in the front had locked up? Throw that out the window. As you know, when you come into the pits, you put this air hose into the top of the car and it lifts the car up. Well, see, there's some new patches on pit road. Unfortunately, where the lift came down is onto one of those patches. It buried itself into the ground and it got stuck when it was trying to retract. So Michael was literally stuck up in the air in the front of the car with his wheels spinning in the rear. Well, boy, that's something different, Paul. But he is still almost a lap ahead. So for all his setbacks, his speed on the track is, has more than made up for them. Very shortly, Michael Andretti should get a glimpse of the number 12 car, the black and gold machine of Bobby Rahal ahead of him. And Michael should then have some impetus to be closing. There's Mike Croft, his first race this season, a great young driver. Well, I asked Al Jr., Al Unser Jr., about Mike Croft, and he said, here's a guy who's really done it right, meaning that he's come through the hard way with no big dollar sponsor or family money to open the doors, and he's worked his way up the ladder rung by rung. Midget, Super Vs, he won the Indy Lights Championship back in 89. Today, he epitomizes the young driver struggling to put together a sponsorship package, and his week is crammed with phone calls and letter writing all sorts of frustrating stuff, the kind of thing Buddy Lazier, who we saw earlier, has to do. We wish it had more to do with actual racing, but that's just not the name of the game these days. It's finding the money first and then getting to go racing. Mike Groff. Tell you, somebody that invests in Mike Groff is going to find a great reward. He currently runs in this car that he's most unfamiliar with in 16th place. Michael Andretti, Bobby Rahal, alone on the leader lap. As we take a look at this fight, there is Eddie Cheever. Cheever runs in sixth place. Raul Boisel was right there with him. Let's go down pit side in the Chip Ganassi pit and Gary Gerald. Ari Leyendike is watching this race and it's got to be frustrating, Ari, to have to be a spectator, but we thought we were going to see you at the ovals for Chip Ganassi. Well, at least uh, Eddie Cheever is doing a good job here with the target Scotch car and uh, I'm hopeful of doing Michigan 500 and possibly some races before that, but uh, right now we're still in the same position we were before. It all depends on sponsorship. Is it tough to see Robbie Gordon in the car and you not be there? Well, that was part of the agreement that uh, Chip Ganassi had with uh, Ford Motor Company that Robbie would run uh, selected races and uh, at least one oval. So uh, that's their deal, and uh, we're just trying to make my deal work out this year. We miss you out here. Well, I miss it too. Thanks, Thanks. Ari. Paul? Boy, if that isn't proof that money is still calling the tune in this year's racing. Ari Leyendike, you see, Rick Emerson Mears, Pettipaldi Emerson Pettipaldi grabbed Pettipaldi. John Andretti for 10th place. But if even Ari Leyendike, who's won at Indianapolis, can't have a ride because he can't bring some money with him, that's tough. 
very tough time both in the global economy and that ripples right on through into racing of any form as you saw John Andretti and that little fight with Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti has now clinched that bonus point so important for leading the most laps in this race bonus points this year that Michael's earned now eight Bobby Rahal has only earned two that Fittipaldi Andretti battle though, is for 10th place way back for drivers of that reputation and now just ahead of Michael Andretti he can definitely see Bobby Rahal as can we there's just one car that separates Michael and the second place machine you know that's Bobby Rahal right there with Michael right behind him. Michael's not really trying to press that, getting uh, Bobby Rahal down a lap, Paul. That's kind of strange right now because it's right in the palm of his hand. Michael Andretti right behind Bobby Rahal. There he is. They still have Buddy Lazier separating them. Now no longer. It's Bobby Rahal that is just in front of Michael. The race continues on the Milwaukee Mile. A great town known for many things, but perhaps most of all, beer. And they honor it. This is the Caves Museum down in there from the old days. The great vats of beer. Magnificent collection also of beer bottles of all the different beers produced out of this region. Well, at the race, the Miller Genuine Draft 200. The lead belongs to Michael Andretti. He's trying to close still and get around the second place car of Bobby Rahal. If the race were to end right now, the championship picture would look like this. Rahal would still be leading with 96 points. Alan Sir Jr. and Emerson Fittipaldi would still be in second and third, but Michael Andretti would fall into fourth place from sixth. He'd be only 33 points back. Michael Andretti is Bobby Rahal's living nightmare. This is exactly what was happening at this point in the season last year when Michael Andretti with superior speed to Bobby Ray Hall began his chance. And you see Ray Hall right on the outside now. He's got to resist Michael Andretti if he possibly can. The hunted and the hunter. Ray Hall still trying to hold on by his fingertips. There he is just ahead, slower traffic. Michael Andretti tries to capitalize on Ellinger Jr.'s move, and he does as Michael Andretti comes to the inside of Ray Hall. And now Michael Andretti runs on a lap of his own. The rest of the field is a full mile behind. That means if Michael doesn't drop out of the race for sure, Bobby Ray Hall doesn't have a chance of winning the race. It really bothers him, especially after falling out of court last week. But what Michael surely has to think about is how many times he has dominated in races thus far this season only to have something go wrong at the very last minute remember just for example the Indianapolis 500 Jack Aru? oh this is exactly what the team wanted what they decided to do for their strategy that's now begun to unfold is they were going to set a torrid pace in the first half of the race they just moments ago radioed to Michael Andretti okay now back off on the fuel because what they are still worried about is what is in this tank right here and in this hose. They feel they now, if they can back it off, they can go the distance, but they did have to back up. They've gone to minus two. Let's check with Gary get Gerald. Gary? Paul here in the Bobby, or Jack, I should say, in the Bobby Rahal pit, they're working at the computers making fuel calculations. What we do know now is that the window is open. If there's a yellow, they make the stop, then they get the fuel that carries them the distance. What they're determining is how far they can go waiting for the yellow. We believe it's going to be around a lap 175 before he'll have to make the final stop. But, of course, now that strategy business with Michael a full lap ahead, they've got to hope here that something happens to Michael Andretti's car. What a performance Michael is making. Last time that a Milwaukee race winner finished on a lap by himself was in 1986. As we look at the two car owners, there's Carl Haas. You saw Carl Hogan, Bobby Rahal's partner a moment ago. Michael Andretti led everybody else by a full lap and beat runner-up Tom Sneva by a lap in six seconds in 1986 to score his second career win. There is Michael Andretti. But remember, too, two years ago, he ran out of fuel with just two miles to go. As we look at the race summary after 140 laps, look at that tremendous dominance that Michael Andretti is showing here. And the cars out of the race, chassis, Robbie Gordon, Ross Cheever, who's driving for A.J. Boyd, crashed the primary car earlier in this week, and they brought out the 91 for Ross. Emerson Fittipaldi up behind Mario Andretti in a battle for eighth place. There they come off of the corner. 
Mario trying to hold on. Two great former world champions, two great veterans here. The hard speeds have settled everybody down an awful lot, Paul. And a lot of the racing that we've seen earlier has just slowed down. Now, there's some good racing right there. We see M.O. and, and uh, Mario going at it. But it's settled everybody down a lot. They've got their tires pretty well heated up. Some of them worn out. Their fuel is getting low. They've already calculated their fuel. They're just going for the end of the race now. The interesting thing, Bobby, is so many of the cars are still in the running. Very few mechanical problems so far. Knock on wood. So back on board with Bobby Rahal. There's Raul Boisel. As he fights now with Ray Hall, not a battle for position. Boisel runs in sixth place. Eric Bachelard just made a pit stop and is coming back up to speed. There you see him low on the track. This is a time of the race also when the track is slippery. Eric Bachelard, the number 19 car out of the Dale Coyne stable, just completing his pit stop. Now here is the young man that is uh, in the lights champion, and he leads the points fight for rookie of the year. He is the points leader over Jimmy Vassar and Brian Bonner. See on the side of the car, if we get a look at it, the Chicago Bulls logo. We get a five view of it right there. Dale Coyne from Chicago, big Bulls fan, kind of uh, celebrating their success. So the question now on the Milwaukee Mile, with 147 laps complete, is can Michael Andretti carry this car to the finish, and does he have sufficient fuel to do that? Now, coming into this race, we asked Michael Andretti if this particular track, the Milwaukee Mile, allows a driver to have a car that's less than perfect and still have that car be totally competitive. I think so. I think we did that last year. I don't think we had a real good car here, but uh, we hung in there all day. Um, we had a little luck where a couple guys had some problems, but uh, we were there. We, were, we led most laps, and, and we, were lead, we were leading when those guys were dropping out, too. So. You know, it was a good fight, good battle. It was like one guy would do well in a certain part of the stint, and he'd go back, come back to you. And, you know, it, it's that sort of track, yeah. Michael Andretti, the lead of the race. His wife, Sandy, of course, Michael, a Ford-powered car. Ford scored their first win after six tries last week at Portland. That's an enviable record and a great finish. Ford has now announced that there will be more teams carrying this engine in the 1993 season, though they have not indicated who they are. They've made the one caveat that Chevrolet made several years ago. They don't want to give an engine to anybody unless they can properly service that engine. So there may not be quite as many Ford engines available as originally anticipated, but still, a lot of folks, because of Michael's performance, are going to want it. Yes, Paul, and also, Chevrolet is building their third engine, another new engine. They're hoping to have that ready for next year's running. You know, Michael, when he qualified fifth, I thought he would be very upset with that. He's so, become so used to qualifying on the pole. He seemed very relaxed about it, and it's obvious why now. They knew what was wrong. They knew they could be competitive when the race started. Raul Boisel is in. Gary Gerald is there. Well, this is one of those drivers making just a two-stop race. He had to lock up the brakes and skid into position. They make the wing changes, both front, right, and left. Now they're holding him. Got a problem on the right rear. I don't know if it's an air gun malfunctioning or a wheel nut that's been frozen, but this is just a real tough break for Raul Boisel. It's at the right rear, and they still haven't been able to get it in place. This time they're holding him and holding him, and now they continue to work. And the frustration, oh my, what a tough blow for Bosell. Raul came into the pits in sixth place already. Fittipaldi has moved around him, Bobby Unzer. Yes, and you can watch his wing adjustment. That shows you what the radios are doing. We can't see that, but he was telling them up of the wings when they were on the track, but when he came in, he says, no. The guy put the wing in, he took it right back out. Of course, the danger, and we may have seen it there, is you're working so fast. When you jam that big nut on, you may actually cross-thread it. That is, get it not following in the threads, but actually cutting through the threads. And when you do that, you're in real trouble. That's right, Paul. Remember, also, these nuts are locked on when they go on. They won't come off by themselves, or the wheel won't come off. So therefore, sometimes those things get jammed up just a little bit. At any rate, it was a real bad break for him. So Michael Andretti, the fastest lap of the race at 150.8 miles an hour, is shattering the record that he set last year, averaging 137 miles an hour. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. 
The Miller Genuine Draft 200 is all part of Summerfest. There's the stilt man down at Summerfest. He's having a great time. And it's a giant record crowd here, a sellout on the Milwaukee Mile. And they are watching as Michael Andretti continues to dominate this field as he has throughout the season. But look at Bobby Rahal. Rahal is trying to get his lap back. Bobby Rahal to the outside. Michael Andretti holds him off. I would think more wisely Michael would just let him go. Michael still has a full mile lead on Bobby Ray Hall. But Bobby Ray Hall needs that lap back. He's hoping that he can get it back. Can he hold on to it? No, Michael's still there. Michael's holding him off. This is the aggressive Ray Hall that we talked to, to you about. He's taking a major chance here, trying to get back on the same lap, which would give him a chance if there was a yellow. And he's done it. Boy, you can just see the Ford and the Chevy down the straightaway, identically the same here at Milwaukee. Ray Hall did it on the outside. Let's go to the pitch, Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, a quick follow-up on Bosell. As we suspected, it was a cross threaded wheel nut on the right rear. He was in the pits 44 seconds. His teammate, Scott Brayton, running in fourth place. His career best finish is a fifth at Portland about five years ago. So an opportunity for a bit of history for Brayton today. But keep in mind, he's one of those drivers that also needs a yellow, or he's going to have to make a green flag pit stop in the late stages of the race. There you see the 22 car, a car of Scott Brayton. Nice young man from Coldwater, Michigan. His father, Lee, was a driver. Family still very, very close together. And Scott looking for his best finish ever in an Indy car. We were talking, in fact, I was talking with Morris Nunn today about drivers that are ready to go through and crack that barrier, suddenly take a win. Of course, Morris Nunn feels that his driver, Eddie Cheever, would be one of them. This is another one. Scott Brayton, Scott Goodyear is certainly one of them. Bosell. Bosell would be one. Any of these guys, Scott Pruitt, of course, another one. You're right on board with Scott. Once they get that win, Bobby Enzer, wouldn't you think that that's just what they need to continue winning? Oh, it certainly is, Paul. It, it's like a guy getting a big needle of energy. He really goes for it. Look, look at the vibration here that Scott Pruitt is enduring today. They've had problems with vibration in this car this whole weekend, and I think until Scott Pruitt gets himself another car, he's not going to break into that winner's Sam, circle. Excuse me, that's not that's the camera doing that. The car's not doing that. The front wings are shaking on his car really bad, but the car itself is smooth. The camera's just come a little bit loose. I don't want to create the impression, though, in any way, Bobby Unser, that this is a smooth track. It's one tough track. I know, but you know what? When the guys get their shocks adjusted, now watch his hands there. Those are the rough bumps that they're going over. And they're not really heaves in the track, only like into turn four. Down low, you have those big heaves. Bobby, watch his hands, and those are the little, little cross bumps where they put the sealer across after the freeze in the winter. Bobby, if you check that rear view mirror and also the cowling just uh, in, in front of Scott Pruitt's hands, there's a lot of vibration in that car. I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be driving it. So Scott Pruitt, he runs in uh, back in the field right now in 12th place. You can see for yourself as you watch the wheel move up and down over some of the bumps. Now, the indication is that this car is running a little sour. That's Rick Mears, of course, and he runs in, uh, in fourth now, place but, right but, now. But he had run in third. After they uh, adjusted the fuel mixture, he moved up into third. There's his teammate, Fittipaldi, who is coming up right behind him. So Rick Mears in fifth place, as you said, Sam. Fittipaldi is running in seventh. And Rick still seems to hold on, though he has taken a more conservative line. No, he's definitely you know, he's, acknowledging he, there that something's wrong. Yeah, he's, he's definitely down on power because you can see down the straightaway, Emma was just eating him alive there. And so he definitely has problems. They're both running the Chevrolet B engines and the only ones that are in the race. 30 laps to go, so he has no chance, even if he can struggle around to the finish, to stay in the top five or six. That's a shame for Rick Mears, who really needed a good run today for his morale and for the team. The team, after all, Penske's great racing team has not won a race since the opener in Australia. The Newman Haas team waiting for the arrival of Michael Andretti in what would be his last stop of the race. He continues to set a blistering pace. Now a full four miles an hour faster than the record as Bobby Rahal comes in. And Ray Hall now with a change of tires. Routine on all four corners, and they will wait to get the last ounce of fuel into that car. Already it is refueled, and they signal Bobby Ray Hall out and back.
back into the fight in a blistering 11.7 seconds. And he's pretty happy with his car because as I watch the television screen, they put two half turns. That's one turn on the left front wing, which pulled the left front tire down to the track a little tighter. And here comes Michael Andretti. Jack Roots there. And Paul, this is six laps sooner than they had planned. Michael radioed in. He thought he had a tire going down, so they said, let's not chance it. They are doing a time stop. What they've done is they've filled the tank with as much as they've got in 11.7 seconds but they have left four gallons in the filler hose that could be the difference who knows i wonder what they know that allows them to lead that they did not want to take the chance bobby unser though you predicted that michael would be in on the 172nd lap that's exactly where he came in yes it was ray hall and michael both uh, my little figure worked out good that time the thing that worried me a little bit about michael paul was that you should take on all the fuel he has a good advantage speed wise on ray hall he should have taken on a little bit more fuel i'm not too sure that it was a good move to make the two stops kept the leaders of the race michael andretti and bobby ray hall in relative positions ray hall still a lap down he did not make anything up. Many years ago, Penske, Roger Penske, there's beer slowing down. Roger Penske started these time stops, and it's so calculated that you, what you have to do, and you have to rely totally on what your computer's telling you, Paul. Rick Mears, who we watch as he slows down, has not led a lap on an oval at any time this year. The last time he went this deep into a season without leading a lap was back in 1987. Boy, you got to know that bothers Roger Penske. I've never known a man in my life that hates to lose races as much as Roger Penske does. He is just fuming, and he's not his normal self. Well, for that matter, Rick Mears. But remember, Rick is still suffering from injuries suffered in the practice of the Indianapolis 500. Let's get an update on Rick from Jackaroot. Well, Paul, you were on top of it before the crew was. We were talking to them when you said the car started to slow down. About a lap later, Rick Radio said we're down to seven cylinders. So they're going to try and limp home. And if, well, he goes, if he goes by on the front straightaway, I can hear he only has seven cylinders. It's outstanding. There goes Rick Mears down the front stretch. Oh. We'll get you back to Danny Sullivan. We were on board with him just a second ago. He runs in 13th place as Rick Mears fights this car. You know, after Indy, which of course the Gallus team managed to win, they knew that they had to test, that they had real car problems. And they came up here for two days and having wrung every last ounce of speed out of the car, they watched as Michael Andretti arrived and unloaded his car and went as fast right away as they could. So they have big car problems and they know it. So there's Danny Sullivan. Now look right behind him and look at the smoke. Rick Mears puffs the smoke off the left bank of that engine. See, and often what has happened because he's only got seven cylinders is he's probably dropped us on a valve, a, an intake valve out of the engine or exhaust valve. It goes out through the exhaust. The engine is technically blown. He's just struggling, and they won't go very long. That's a 13,000 RPM engine, Paul. Rick Mears recognizes that we are now only 20 miles from the finish of this race and he would love to keep the car at least limping to the finish. Right now, he is running well down in the order in fifth place, but that's still a points paying position, and he'd love to stay there if he could. And another thing, remember, Roger Penske is making the decision on Rick and his engine. Rick is a smart enough driver to know to pull in when it's missing like that. Roger Penske's saying, I need the point. So remember, he's risking the dollars. Rick Mears is keeping it going. Well, Michael Andretti and Bobby Rahal, as we watch Eddie Cheever, who runs in third. Michael Andretti is the lead. Bobby Rahal is on that lead lap with him, but a full 23 seconds back, trying desperately to catch up. He likes to read history. He likes to read biographies of the great people like Winston Churchill and Genghis Khan and Julius Caesar. Right now, he's reading about Franklin Roosevelt. When he writes, and Eddie Cheever likes to write, it's his hobby, he writes fiction, short stories. But I don't think any of that's on his mind just at the moment. And his writing translates into his demeanor. He's a well-spoken, quiet man. As the Ganassi team lays out the equipment for Eddie Cheever, he should be in shortly. And he's best on a one-on-one -on -one situation. He doesn't suffer fools very lightly, and he's not very good at waving and glad-handing big groups of people. But one-on-one, -on -one, you realize what a penetratingly intelligent and really genuinely nice man this is. A very gentleman. 
Yes, and you can see Bobby Ray Hall just zoomed by him. Eddie's getting ready to come in the pitch. There's Rick Mir is already in. There's Rick. You know, I said his injured can't last very long when it's missing like that. Remember again, 13,000 RPM, 12 and a half thousand. These engines, when they have problems, Paul, just won't go very long. It's not like the old days. Bobby Jerry Breon just... at the back of the car signaled to shut the thing off, and now with the calling off, it's shut down. Looks like Mick Mears may be out now. Eddie Cheever, third place, comes in on the 181st lap for his stop, Gary Gerald. Boy, he slides it in, Paul. He had to lock up the wheels to get it done. He's here now for 15 gallons of fuel. That's all they've got to go, 16 or 17 laps. I'm not certain that it's going to be close on fuel for Cheever. He's down off the jacks, and he's out of here. Eddie Cheever in and out. Nice little stop for the Ganassi crew. Michael Andretti is still the lead. The top three cars in the field have all completed what should be their final stop in the race. We're running at a record pace. Only one yellow thus far, and Michael Andretti is the leader. Back with just 10 miles to go with the Miller Genuine Draft 200 on the Milwaukee Mile. There's the second place car. That's Bobby Rahal. And lining up behind him is Michael Andretti, but Michael is leading this race by a full mile. And Michael, if he can run to the finish, will of course take all of the points home. The point for leading the most laps and the 20 points for the win of the race. Points that Michael desperately leads if he's going to get back into this championship fight. Let's go down to Jack Aroot. Paul, this is a five gallon pail of water, but that's the amount of fuel that was left in the tank after Michael Andretti left. Now he could have taken that five gallons additional on, but they elected to make that last stop a timed stop. In the past, Michael Andretti has come up short by two miles here at Milwaukee. They're all crossing their fingers right now. A lot of questioning looks in the Newman Haas pit. As Michael Andretti puts another lap into the record books. And let me tell you, he is flying. Debbie Rahal, back at the first race after the birth of their daughter a couple weeks ago. Uh, their daughter, very well named, by the way, Samantha. I like it, and I have met Samantha, and I know babies are cute, but this one is really cute. So Michael Andretti and Rahal is right there trying to get the lap. As he comes around Mario Andretti, he's still struggling through traffic trying to catch this man, Michael Andretti. Michael has slowed down a little bit. He's eased off about a second a lap, but he keeps Bobby Ray Hall in sight. Bobby can't go around and catch up a full lap on him. He needs a yellow flag, but it doesn't look, unless something happens, that we're going to get one, Paul. The leaders of the race have been running at 145 and a half miles an hour. His fastest lap of the race, Michael cranked off at 150.8. And once again, with six laps to go, Michael is averaging 138 miles an hour. The track record that he set last year is 134 and a half. Now you can watch all the drivers, all the cars on the track now. They can sense it's near the end of the race. They're really all getting after it now, given the last that they have. With so much of the race run under green, five laps to go, 195 miles run, you are worried about fuel. There's no question about it. Michael Andretti completes the 196 lap. His wife Sandy keeps track of him. Already Michael is on the back stretch. As we suggested at the beginning, desperately needed points. There's Carl Hogan, Bobby Rahal's partner. Remember yes. that Michael would have closed to within 33 points of Bobby Rahal. That would put him about the same place behind him. He was at this same stage of the season last year. Just nine races left to go. Plenty of time to make up that deficit. So Michael Andretti, but remember, we're approaching the point in the race that two years ago, suddenly the engine sputtered and Michael was out of fuel. With that time pit stop, have they calculated correctly? And they'll only coast about a half a lap around, so even Michael has got his fingers crossed right now. Just think back to Indianapolis. In relative terms, this was the point in which he broke down at Indianapolis, this close to the end. Let's not wish Michael any ill at all, as now with two laps to go, he continues to power on. Is this the second win in a row for both Michael and for that new Ford engine? Michael Andretti looking very strong here. Bobby Rahal would have to hope something goes wrong on Michael's car if he is going to pick up the win of this race. Even the yellow flag won't help Bobby Rahal right now. He needs Michael to drop out. White flag showing to Michael Andretti. Sandy Andretti watches Michael to the backstretch as he continues to roll at full power. Bobby
Bobby Rahal, 18 seconds back, trying to catch him. Michael Andretti oh. slowing off the fourth turn. Michael Andretti, did they cut it too close as the yellow comes out? And it comes out for a situation over on the backside of the course. And Michael Andretti comes to the checkered flag and takes the win with the yellow at the same time. And that's Raul Boisel that got in trouble on the final lap of the race, assuring Michael Andretti a win. For a second there, when we watched Michael slow, we thought maybe something was wrong with his car. Obviously, they calculated perfectly. Ford has their second victory. Michael Andretti, two in a row, and a much-needed 21 points toward the championship battle. So Michael Andretti takes the win on the Milwaukee Mile. We'll be back. Back on the Milwaukee Mile, Michael Andretti has already come to a stop. Next Saturday on ABC Sports, it's a duel in the desert as the pro bowlers shoot for the Tucson PBA Open. Then ABC's Wide World of Sports travels to Oslo, Norway, and a prelude to the Olympics. The world's top middle distance runners will race in the classic Dream Mile Live. Plus, from Germany, the World Weightlifting Championship all next Saturday right here on ABC Sports. Michael Andretti wins it. Gary Gerald's there. Indeed, two in a row. You started the roll at Portland. It continues at Milwaukee in dominant fashion. This makes the big jump in the points, and everything is starting to play out just as you've been hoping. We're trying. We're getting there, but Bobby's doing his job, too. You know, he had a good run and finished second, but uh, like I said, we got to keep winning, keep winning, keep finishing, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll get this thing. What were your fuel concerns today when everybody else was talking about the possibilities of fuel mileage being a problem? No, it was no problem. It was no problem. <laughs> Carl Haas is offering his congratulations. That's his voice you hear saying, you are the best. The man is a promoter. He's a race winner. There is a lot of excitement down here. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you. Now here was that last lap. Michael Andretti rolling for the checkered flag. That's Boisel. Look how close. Boy, not perhaps close for Michael's terms, but I don't want any spinning car running that close. Michael slowed down wisely. The yellow was already out, and Michael took the win. An impressive finish for Michael Andretti. Sandy just relieved. The race is over, and her husband is the winner. Michael's 24th career win, a ninth-place tie with the legendary Ralph De Palma. Down here at the start-finish line, if a man ever needed a yellow flag in the late stages of the race, I think Bobby Rahal was the man. Well, we had that, uh, we really died on that first set of tires. It, it just got so loose on me, and, uh, you know, after that, well, actually, it was the second set, I guess, and uh, that we lost all our time there. And then, uh, you know, once we fiddled with the car a little bit and made a change or two, it, you know, at the end, we could pass Michael and pull away, but unfortunately, I needed a yellow, like you say, and it wouldn't come. You said that you were revitalized at Portland. The performance shows it today. You protect the lead. We congratulate. Thank you, Gary. All right, let's get back upstairs to Paul. Bobby Rahal finishing second. In his best finish ever, Scott Brayton came in in third. This was the moment of victory for Michael Andretti. And there are your points now with Bobby Rahal still in the lead, but Michael Andretti moving within striking distance. As we take a look at the final results, they are unofficial for the next half hour, but it looks without question that Michael Andretti has scored two victories in a row. From here, the Indy cars head off to the first race ever on the Oval at Loudoun, New Hampshire. And then we'll join you again here on ABC Sports on the 19th of July for the run at Toronto. Our first coverage there at Exhibition Place. It's a great race. And Bobby Unser, this one was terrific. Yes, it was. Paul and Fuel didn't play a big factor for the first time in a long time. Made the race better. I think it's astonishing. We saw such a fine performance by Scott Great. Long overdue, a promising young driver finally finishing in the top three. And Scott Goodyear was the winner of today's Texaco Haviland pit stop contest with only two stops for 62.7 seconds. So a great day under the sunshine on the Milwaukee Mile and one terrific race. I'm Paul Page for Sam Posey, Bobby Unzer, Gary Gerald, and Jack Aru. We hope you've enjoyed your time today with the Indy cars at Milwaukee. Stay with us throughout the season as they continue to battle for the PPG Cup and the National Championship. So long from Milwaukee.